Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you, Jen, for the introduction and uh, all of you in the audience for taking the time to tune in today. So the discussion will be coping with pain and anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, just a brief slide for this webinar presentation. There are no financial sponsors, external funding support, or commercial interests. A uh, quick note that I am here of my own accord and the information uh, that is being presented has no reflection or relationship with any of my employers, and that I do have a non-financial working relationship with Payne BC. And then another slide, just a quick uh, slide uh, of a few disclaimer points uh, that you should read and be aware of before proceeding with the webinar. You can certainly pause the video to review it as it becomes available online. I will not read them all out, uh, but I will explain that this webinar does not create a therapist-client relationship, nor is it a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, and you should seek the advice of a qualified professional about your condition before using this information. And then any resources that I do mention in this webinar are simply recommended to promote public awareness and education. The general audience is for adults uh, 19 years of age and older. And a gentle note uh, that when it does come to managing chronic pain and anxiety, and I know that many of you are aware of this already, this does take time. And this is not about a quick fix. So practicing skills and utilizing coping strategies does take time. And as you make progress and take an active role in your recovery, you may begin to see improvement. So today we are going to look at anxiety symptoms that may arise due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, explain and discuss how anxiety relates to pain, and also discuss some coping strategies that have been shown to help with anxiety and pain. During this presentation, you can refer to the information on the slides as I will not be reading everything on the slides at times. I thought it would be important to begin by acknowledging that we are all collectively feeling some degree of heightened anxiety. In the face of a disaster, so in today's case, this unprecedented worldwide pandemic, it would be understandable that people are feeling strong, heightened emotions. All of our lives have changed and many of us are feeling uncertain about what the future is going to look like. And anxiety and fear can be a normal response. So let's take a look at how anxiety works in this very basic model. Essentially, we have important hardwired systems built into our bodies that serve various functions. And some of these systems keep us safe. Anxiety is one of them. It works to detect threats and then protect us from danger. And anxiety is kind of an alarm system. So let's imagine that anxiety functions like a car alarm. A car alarm is installed to keep it from being broken into or stolen. It will go off if it detects danger. And if it's functioning properly, it will not go off if there's no danger. And some car alarms are more sensitive than others. It might go off because of the vibrations of a large truck rumbling by, or maybe somebody accidentally bumps into the car as they're walking along, and then that sets off the alarm and they don't intend to break into the car. Or it simply may be because maybe the car alarm is malfunctioning. If the car alarm goes off, we would typically check uh, to see if there's something going on there. So we would check to see if there's an actual threat. And if there's danger, we may act. So we may stay back and call 911 or try to do something about it. And if there's no danger, we'll typically kind of move along and we'll ignore it. So anxiety is like that car alarm system. It will compel you to act, to find ways to cope with a threat, to stay and defend or escape. And this is sometimes referred to as the flight or fight response.
it's important to briefly note the difference between anxiety and fear as those emotions can affect pain differently. So anxiety is typically associated with concerns about the future. It comes with the sense of apprehension. Fear, on the other hand, is associated with an immediate present threat. So if you're walking along a trail in the park or the forest and you see a large grizzly bear, that's an immediate present threat. With anxiety, the threat is not always as clear as a large grizzly bear in your face. And it occurs when we're faced with uncertainty, with something that's a bit unclear, it's new, unfamiliar, maybe somewhat unpredictable. And with threat, uh, sorry, with fear, the threat is pretty clear. And with anxiety, the threat can be about something inside of us, so something internal, perhaps like pain, or our worries about something that's kind of rolling around in our head. Or it may be something external. So in the context of today's presentation, maybe it could be about the pandemic. And with fear, the threat is typically external, like the grizzly bear that I was talking about. <clears throat> and when it comes to anxiety and pain, anxiety can have a sensitizing effect. So what that means is that with a moderate level of anxiety and fear, we can experience more pain than perhaps in fear conditions. So when it comes to fear and pain, it's not necessarily helpful for our bodies to feel pain when we truly need to escape or defend ourselves from danger like that grizzly bear. So with that surge of arousal that might come with fear as you're facing the grizzly bear, we may not necessarily be focusing our attention on the pain. And this may be due to the amount of attention there is available to pain. So more attention is given to pain when we're feeling anxious, and maybe there's less attention given to pain when we're feeling fear because our survival instincts are telling us, hey, you need to focus on the threat of danger here. There was actually a very interesting study done that divided people into three groups. So there was an anxiety condition, a fear condition, and a neutral condition. And the anxiety and fear groups were told that they may or may not receive a brief electrical shock on their finger. And the fear group may have received the shocks. They did receive some shocks, but the anxiety group actually received no shocks. And the study actually demonstrated that the anxiety about the threat of a future shock alone led to increased pain. So fear and anxiety actually had a bit of an opposite effect on pain reactivity. Now, as much as we have these wonderful, intelligent, danger-detecting systems in our bodies, they have not yet quite caught up to our perhaps newer, more sophisticated parts of our brains. And these systems can have a hard time telling the difference between anxiety and fear because both are signaling some kind of threat. So you may experience similar body sensations that you see up here on the uh, slide. Um, at varying levels of intensity. And if you think about the car alarm example again, it's like the alarm is going off regardless of the type of threat it has felt, whether someone has accidentally bumped into it where there's no real danger, or whether someone is actually breaking into the car where there is real danger. So to recap, anxiety is a normal, helpful response to an unknown, new, unclear situation that is built to motivate us to adapt or respond. However, anxiety can become problematic and unhelpful when it begins to persist and it is intense and it feels uncontrollable, overwhelming, excessive, maybe uh, you are more anxious than what the situation might call for, it can start to interfere with your functioning, perhaps to the point you're not doing what you need to do or want to do, uh, and it makes it difficult to redirect your attention to other things. So it's that car alarm that keeps going off when there is no true danger. A, a quick note here, it's not to say that there isn't real danger with COVID-19. Our health authorities and scientists are advising us to take precautions because of the real risks associated with COVID-19. 
but let's say that you are being appropriate and you are taking precautions and then maybe after that instead of being able to redirect and do other things maybe you can't take your mind off of that in spite of taking and following those precautions and then you're doing things that might be over excessive beyond what might be recommended so for example maybe you never go outside even though uh, there's not a lot of people around. You take a look outside your window, not a lot of people, maybe get a little exercise, some fresh air, but maybe the anxiety is making you feel like you can't go out. So that's when the anxiety starts to become unhelpful. And unhelpful chronic anxiety has been shown to affect us in different ways. So with our health, chronic anxiety can put your body on guard in this state of uh, readiness and it can wear your body down and it has been associated with various kinds of health problems also with our attention when we're feeling anxious about something we tend to naturally put greater attention on it and we focus on it more and this feature again is adaptive because it it has helped us identify a potential threat fairly quickly so that we can do something about it but then as we've mentioned before it becomes unhelpful when we start to focus too much on it and then it's hard to focus on something else that needs your attention so uh, for example we might give attention to COVID-19 uh, and then it takes center stage in your mind and there's this huge spotlight on it and it's difficult to shift our attention and that spotlight tends to amplify the intensity and the importance of that with our mood, you know, sometimes anxiety over the long haul can make us feel quite depleted, frustrated, irritable, demoralized, and maybe even depressed. And with our functioning, it can affect us maybe personally or at work or maybe socially. So at work, maybe if you're spending time or even at home, three to four to five hours of your day glued to the news um, because you're concerned about COVID-19. Uh, or maybe at work you just feel incredibly distracted and it's difficult to stay focused on the tasks that need attending to. Or maybe you're not taking breaks or you're overdoing things or underdoing things because of anxiety. And even socially, maybe you've been withdrawing from people or you're feeling a little more tense and you're short and you might be a little more quick tempered with others. So this diagram here illustrates how anxiety could affect these areas in unhelpful ways. So let's take a moment here now to look at how pain works. And you might notice that this model actually looks very familiar to the anxiety model shown earlier. In fact, they look the same in that pain is also a protection system. So like anxiety, pain is a normal, uncomfortable sensation that motivates us to react and respond so that we could be safe. It's alerting you to a threat, again, like the car alarm going off. So with acute pain, for example, if you stubbed your toe, or you got a paper cut, or maybe you touched something very hot, or perhaps you got stung by something, a bee, your body's uh, sensors, so those nerve endings, we call them those nociceptors, they're spread throughout your body. Um, they detect things like pressure, temperature, chemical sensations. And then those messages that something's happening to your body, it travels up to your brain, and then the brain makes this decision about how dangerous that sensation is. So typically with acute pain, it may last less than three months according to the uh, International Classification of Diseases, 11th edition. And the onset can be quite acute, and then it tends to go away. And it's more easily diagnosable because the source of pain can typically be found out more quickly. With chronic pain, so this is pain that perhaps lasts longer, uh, lasts three months or longer or more, uh, chronic pain may continue even there, even though there's no longer any tissue damage and even after the damage might have healed. So this doesn't mean that your pain is not real. In fact, we tell folks your pain is real. What might have happened is that your brain is signaling, just like that car alarm we mentioned, that there is pain telling you that there's danger, even when there may actually not be. 
And then those messages kind of have become sensitized. So information that you typically ignore is picked up by the brain, it's diffi difficult to ignore, and it can lead us to feeling pain. Your body and your brain, remember, are trying to protect you, but your brain is operating on these kind of faulty danger messages. And it's becoming a bit too efficient, perhaps, at becoming um, a, a detecting system where it's picking up these signals and interpreting them as dangerous. Uh, just a quick note that this is not the case with all chronic pain, of course, um, such as in certain progressive medical conditions. Um, so it's not the same for everything, but generally speaking with chronic pain, uh, pain doesn't necessarily mean that there is new harm or danger. Much like with anxiety, it indicates that there might be danger when there actually may not be. It's like that car alarm going off when there's no actual threat. Well, there can be several reasons for this, and it may be associated with biological, psychological, social, and spiritual factors all contributing to pain. So when we talk about the biological, we're looking at things like genetics, hormones, uh, the nature and the location of an injury, perhaps, your age. With psychological factors, we're looking at thoughts, feelings, past experiences, the context of the situation, your priorities, past memories and behavior. With social factors, we're thinking about things like culture, gender, education, socioeconomic status, employment, uh, the quality of your relationships, maybe the support networks that you have or do not have, where we live, our physical environments. And then with spiritual factors, such as meaning, a uh, sense of purpose, hope and our beliefs. So pain is not just about the physical. And in fact, pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So there is much research now that demonstrates how these psychosocial factors are strong predictors of pain. So we've seen so far that pain and anxiety have some shared mechanisms. Pain can affect many areas of our lives and contribute to worries, like what if this pain doesn't go away? What if I have to depend on these opioids forever to treat my pain? And anxiety too can also exacerbate and enhance pain symptoms. So both pain and anxiety can often co-occur together and clinical anxiety disorders are often diagnosed together with pain. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the worries that we have about the pandemic, so this is an external stressor, and the pain inside of our bodies, which is internal, can certainly heighten feelings of anxiety, you know, and then also pain. So what can we do about this? So it can be helpful to try focusing first on the things that are within your control, because those are the things that you have some more power to change. What you see here on the slide, this is a non-exhaustive list of coping strategies. There are many others. Remember, there are bio, psycho, social, spiritual factors all contributing to pain and mental health. And there are different ways of managing those different areas as well. Also, some strategies may work better in some situations than in others. And also some work nicely in combination. So for example, it could be helpful that while you are taking a break, you're setting some nice boundaries and you're also taking a few relaxing breaths. So it's beneficial to have a range of coping strategies to select from so that you can flexibly use them where and when they are most suitable. So they're kind of like tools in a toolkit and you can select the tool that works best for a specific situation. The strategies here that you are also seeing are mostly psychological and behavioral. They are not the only psychological behavioral tools available for pain and anxiety. For now, I'm bringing these seven areas that are supported by some of the literature 
to your attention. And I call them the seven Bs. And some of these are brief shorthand versions of skills that may require more guidance from a health professional or some further self-learning. And some of the next few slides, there will be a post of a few reputable websites you could explore for self-learning and I will bring your attention to them as we go along. So one thing we look at when we think about balance thinking, one thing we might be able to change is our thinking. So thinking can affect how we feel. And it's important to recognize when our thinking falls into a kind of pattern that keeps you in a state of distress. We become perhaps a little more vulnerable to distorted kinds of thinking when we are feeling strong emotions. And this kind of thinking can trap you, hence the term thinking trap, in feeling emotional distress. So one kind of thinking trap is called all or nothing thinking, or perhaps you've heard of this as black or white thinking. So thinking in the extremes and not so much in the middle or those grays. Then there's catastrophizing. So you're imagining the worst case scenario, that something so bad will happen and it's gonna be unbearable. With emotional reasoning, your feelings might be influencing your perceptions and your judgment. And then you take that as truth. With negative filtering, there might be a tendency to focus exclusively on the negatives. It's hard to look at anything else but that. And then with overestimating, uh, this is when you may be overestimating the likelihood that something bad is going to happen. And probably while you're doing this, underestimating your ability to cope with it. Now, the purpose of this, to explore these thinking traps and to discuss them, is certainly not to minimize or ignore the very real concerns that this pandemic brings. And it's not to say that all your thinking, if it's negative, is distorted. In fact, the negative thoughts that you do have may certainly reflect some facts and the truth. This is truly um, an unprecedented life-changing event. But the point of bringing this to your attention is that we want to keep these thoughts in check as when they start to develop into a pattern and they are repeating and constant to the point where it feels like these kinds of thoughts are overtaking your mind and they might overwhelm you then to the point where you're experiencing even more emotional distress and that can interfere with your functioning. So these kinds of thoughts can fuel the fear and the anxiety. So it's important to pay attention to them when they might be happening. So it wouldn't be unusual to fall into thinking traps, as we've mentioned, when we're stressed. And so this acronym might help to balance the thinking. So catch, check, change with compassion. So if you are catching it, you're noticing, you're recognizing and identifying, hmm, this may be a thinking trap that I'm falling into here. And when you're checking it, you can ask yourself several questions. So is this thought helping me right now? Is it warranted? Is it a reasonable thought? Is it a fair thought? Uh, if a close friend were having this kind of thought, what might I tell them? What facts or information uh, supports the way that I'm thinking now? And what facts or information does not necessarily support the way that I'm thinking now? Is what I'm thinking 100% true? Or is there a different way to look at this issue that I'm thinking of? Is this really a, a threat? Might there be a way to look at this like a challenge or even an opportunity? Thinking also about what are the advantages of thinking this way? And what are the disadvantages of thinking this way? And when you're checking your thoughts, you could compare your thoughts 
with facts. For example, if you're thinking about COVID-19, you could compare it with facts from trusted sources. So this is an exercise in learning that you, you don't necessarily need to believe every single thought you have, and you want to maybe question some of the thoughts that you are having. And then when it comes with changing, this is where the balance part comes in. So you might want to come up with a more accurate and fair balanced thought at this time. And an easy way to start practicing is perhaps to start a sentence with even though. So even though I am in pain right now, I've been able to get through this before, I can try to relax by breathing, or focusing on something else to ease the pain right now. Or using and statements. So I'm having a tough time right now and I am using my coping skills to help me through it. Then compassion. So while you're engaging in this process of balancing thinking, we're being gentle with ourselves, understanding and kind, trying to move away from that self-critical self-talk and recognizing that, you know, it's your brain's job to think and it has many thoughts and that your one thought that you're having right now is one of many. And acknowledging that everybody can have thoughts like this and you are doing the best you can. And we have all fallen into thinking traps before. And if you're thinking of trying this out for the first time, recognize that this can feel awkward. So acknowledging that with compassion, it can feel a bit strange, might be a bit frustrating as with anything else you might be trying for the first time. So below here are some websites that I have listed as resources. If you want to learn more about balanced thinking, there are some lovely exercises that are available for free. Compassion can also look like helpful, positive coping statements that can help us through pain and anxiety. And these can help us refocus our attention, get grounded and present and feel more in control. So statements like one step at a time, recognizing I'm feeling anxious now, this will pass. Thinking that I'm having a thought and a thought is just a thought. I don't necessarily need to believe everything that I am thinking. Thinking perhaps of just one way that you have overcome this situation before. And also recognizing as we are learning today that anxiety does not necessarily mean that it's a bad emotion. So it's something that's very dangerous. Sometimes people like to um, make cards out of their coping statements and carry it around with them as reminders to use when they are feeling anxious or when they are feeling pain. So here we have the second B of the seven Bs. Anxiety can lead to an arousal of our alarm system. It can activate that flight and fight response that we were talking about. And that's related to the sympathetic nervous system. And when we're feeling physiologically aroused, we're more likely to have these anxious thoughts. So what we want to try and do is activate the rest and digest system. So this is our parasympathetic nervous system. And there are many resources out there around ways to breathe to help with relaxation. And one popular way of breathing is to try something called belly breathing. You can actually feel this a little more if you're lying down, if you can, where you are focusing on your belly as you breathe. And sometimes it helps to actually put one flat hand on your chest and one flat hand on your belly and take a breath in, gentle breath, and notice whether your chest is rising or your belly is rising. And with anxiety, people tend to breathe into their chest. So it's, it's kind of like chest breathing. So to try to activate that relaxation response, 
is to try breathing in through your nose or your mouth and then imagining your belly expanding and raising. There's also another way as you're breathing in and breathing out, thinking of calming and soothing words, for example, like peace as you breathe in and as you breathe out, thinking about the word calm. And for some of you out there, uh, breathing might be uncomfortable or it might be distressing to you. And so you may consider focusing on a pleasant, relaxing scene instead in your mind. So using visualization in your mind to picture something soothing and relaxing instead. And again, here are some of the websites that I've listed on this slide where you could go and engage in some guided exercises to promote relaxation. The third B that I have listed is taking breaks. So when you are engaging in certain activities and tasks to make sure that you are taking breaks, even if they are brief, simply to just have a sip of water, to make sure that you use the washroom. And if you are engaging in activities, you want to ensure that you are pacing. So you, you don't want to look at overdoing things. This may cause a pain flare up. So you can base your pacing on time. So maybe five minutes you engage in a task and then maybe you take a two minute break or you divide the tasks into short workable parts. Now we need to be flexible with some of these strategies. So sometimes pacing is not always possible, right? Maybe you need to rush and get something done. So it's not to say that these are hard and fast, concrete strategies that you must use with every situation, but it's nice to kind of keep these strategies in mind when we're thinking about managing anxiety and pain. And you may want to kind of stretch and move in a safe way when you are taking a break and make sure that you do consult with a physician or a healthcare provider for advice about movement, uh, especially if you have some sort of specific health condition or maybe you are recovering from surgery and maybe movement is not recommended at that time. And also using a break. So we're talking about maybe taking a mental break as well. So taking your mind off of things. With this one, we want to be somewhat cautious uh, because if you are using distraction as a way to avoid something um, too much, that can sometimes backfire. So uh, if you are distracting, you want to do it in what I've written here is healthy conscious doses. And you want to be careful of engaging in excessive unhealthy behaviors. So that might be something like overusing substances or over gaming or over gambling or overeating. That taking a nice break, distracting yourself can be helpful. And speaking of breaks, I thought that this might be a nice time for you to take a brief break for yourself as you are listening to this webinar. Maybe you can take this opportunity to gently shift your gaze away from the screen, give your eyes a break. Take that moment to gently breathe into your belly, releasing some tension. And maybe as you do this, you notice your posture and how you're sitting. Maybe your shoulders drop a little bit. And if you've been sitting still this whole time, this could be an opportunity for you to stretch, and move safely and have that sip of water, you know, a, a sip of your tea, and then we can continue. The fourth B here that I am focusing on on this slide is around boundaries. So it can be helpful to protect your waking and your sleep rituals. And when you wake up, you may want to consider following your typical waking routine, you know, using the washroom, brushing your teeth, 
without first checking the media. And same thing for your sleep ritual. Uh, there have been some suggestions out there about no news two hours before bed or even during your day with boundaries. You may want to consider limiting the media. So not turning to the media every hour or so. So maybe you wanna limit it to two times a day for 15 minutes or 30 minutes, not the whole day, not for three or four hours. You wanna set some boundaries with the media so you're not bombarding your system with all of this stressful information, keeping you in this place of anxiety. Building your tolerance for uncertainty is the fifth B that I'm mentioning here. And when we're talking about this, we're talking about how uh, some people need to feel like they're in complete control. And many of us want to feel in complete control. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's sometimes having an intolerance for uncertainty can underlie worrying and anxiety and keep it going. So this need to be 100% sure all the time about things, checking and reassurance seeking and making these lists to feel like you're in complete control as a way to reduce uncertainty, that can sometimes kind of lead to higher levels of anxiety. And so to reduce those unhelpful levels of anxiety, one way is to actually start building your tolerance for uncertainty and understanding that life is often full of uncertainty. And so this can be done by starting to change our behavior. So the things that I just mentioned that people will try to do things to gain control, reassurance seeking, uh, checking things excessively, for example, like the media, or even sometimes avoiding or procrastinating. So this last one makes sense because we typically want to escape and avoid things if it feels distressing. It, it's a threat. Um, so we want to start changing these behaviors because if we don't, then that will only maintain that intolerance for uncertainty and anxiety. So when you're doing this, you may want to start with small, simple, easy, low risk kind of tasks. Uh, the example that I'm giving is perhaps not checking the news as excessively or as often as you might be doing. Perhaps not making excessive to-do lists. Maybe the list can be a little bit shorter. Or maybe you give a little more responsibility to somebody. Maybe you're so used to being in control, it's really hard for you to give other people responsibility. So you take this opportunity to practice letting go of that small and easy steps. And a resource that talks more extensively about building your tolerance for uncertainty is listed on this slide. So it's a, a website that you could consider reviewing. The sixth B is the basics. So paying attention on our basic needs. We do not need to set these lofty grand goals to become uh, proficient in a new language or learn to play a new instrument. And if you do so, uh, that's fine as well. But um, sometimes having these kinds of, I should be doing something, I should start oil painting, I should make the best use of my time uh, while I'm being quarantined, sometimes that can actually end up fueling our anxiety. We call that the should thinking. And so reminding ourselves that hey, I'm actually doing something productive by sticking to the basics, doing what I already know, digging where the ground is soft. You don't need to pick places that are trickier to dig or harder to dig. You can do the things that you already know, and that is okay. So eating healthily, taking time to protect those sleep rituals, uh, exercising, you know, moving as it is safe to do so, Connecting with others virtually, this is basic. We, we all need and want to connect with others. It's unusual to be apart from the people that we care about, from our peers and our colleagues. And this is physical distancing, it's not social distancing. 
committing to the routines that you have. So every day kind of getting up at the same time if you can. So these are the basic things that you can just continue to do. And the last B is being. So it's a state of being. Um, anxiety can sometimes make us want to avoid things, including our own anxious thoughts and feelings. The more that we avoid, however, it may give you a sense of temporary relief, but it will continue to maintain that, that anxiety. So one way to engage in something rather than avoid is called mindfulness. And mindfulness is about paying attention to the present moment purposefully and non-judgmentally. So it's a way to learn how to perhaps be less automatically reactive to threats. It teaches us to pause and give time to make a decision about how we may want to proceed. And it can help gradually change the relationship that you may have with pain and anxiety. So this, like breathing and everything else that was discussed today around the strategies, does take time and practice. And one way to start mindfulness is to practice simply observing and describing your experience objectively, like a scientist might. Facts. So a place to start can be your breath. So describing how your breath feels as you breathe in through your nose or your mouth, as it moves into your belly, noticing the temperature of the air, if the air is cool or not, noticing how it moves into your belly and describing that your belly is rising as you breathe in. That can be a place to start or you can utilize your five senses. So describing something that you see, so visual, seeing something in detail, noticing the colors, the textures of that, or hearing a sound that you hear. What do you hear? Is it loud? Is it soft? We're using the sensation of touch, perhaps there's something that you can feel in the moment and describe it as you're feeling that particular texture or item. And a quick note here is that mindfulness is not relaxation, although sometimes engaging in mindfulness, it can lead to relaxation. And mindfulness is not about falling asleep. It's actually uh, more about falling even more awake and paying attention and tuning into what is happening. And also, if this becomes overwhelming, you can stop and utilize another strategy. So I've listed some resources here that delve a little further into mindfulness and what it is. And some of these websites and this app has some guided mindfulness activities that you may consider trying. Now, if your anxiety is so severe and extreme that you are feeling very overwhelmed, you're having trouble concentrating, it's interfering with your functioning, you may want to consider getting professional help. And I've listed some things on this slide that you can turn to if you're noticing that some of these things are getting in the way of you being able to live the life that you want. Consider, you may want to consider getting professional help. So if there's big changes in these various areas of, of, of functioning, consider seeking some professional support. I'm briefly going to list some crisis resources up on this slide. And also unique to COVID-19 is there is a psychological support service that has been made available recently. It is free. Uh, please remember that this is not therapy. This is not a crisis line. It is a support service. So if you want to find out more information about what this is, 
you could certainly go to the website and learn more. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. I'm just going to slide through all of these and get to the end. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. G. That was really informative and um, we had some, uh, those were some great resources. Um, so I just invite anybody who has a question to enter it um, into either the chat or the Q and A, uh, and we can just take a few moments if there are any questions to um, to go over them. One of the things people were wondering, Dr. G, was um, just during the chat, it kind of came up. Uh, is um, is if we can compile a list of the resources that you review during this presentation. So we can certainly, um, after this, uh, as I've responded to some of you, we did record today's session. We will send out a link to everybody that registered with the link to the recording. As well, the webinar will live on PainBC's website in our webinar archive so you can actually just search for it in the search bar um, so there's lots of ways to get this information again but um, i think people would find it really helpful uh, if we also included a link to some of those resources that you mentioned dr g so just um just to so i can make sure i've got all of them you were talking about uh Kelty's Key yes. com. Anxiety Canada, um, and then there was the psychologist.bc.ca uh, COVID-19 resources, and that's for em kind of emergency uh, psychological first aid. Um, and then, uh, was there anything else that you thought would be really good? And then you had the, your crisis resources. And was there anything else? Well, I think that's a, a pretty good summary. Those were the main ones. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, just to clarify that the resource for uh, the Psychological Association, so the BC, uh, British Columbia Psychological Association, that that is, uh, it's not a crisis line. Uh, that if you are feeling that you need to talk to somebody and you are going through some form of crisis, that the crisis resources that I listed on that other slide may be more appropriate. Great, thank you. Um, and someone was just uh, reminding me that you also had some mindfulness resources. Yes, so uh, anxietycanada.com uh, has something called a mind shift app. Mm. So that is free and that is something that you could consider exploring that could have some exercises, some guided exercises there for you. Some thinking exercises just to, is that right? Or exercises? Right. As so, opposed to? Yep, for, for mindfulness, for relaxation, and also some thinking exercises. Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. Mm. Okay, so somebody has a, an interesting uh, question uh, in the Q&A. So this person says that they have chronic foot, foot pain mm -hmm. and they're wondering if these techniques work if the tissues are not healing. So um, I'll, I'll just read the question, Dr. G, and then uh, you can take, yeah, I'll read the question. So. Uh, they say, it was suggested that I use techniques to ignore pain and it made my feet worse as I was ignoring my pain as suggested and my feet splayed. Uh, there is constant inflammation and swelling. It's making me anxious. I feel these are helpful techniques. I'm just having difficulty with being told to ignore what I feel and see and watching the damage continue. That's a very good question. That is a very good question. I would agree with you, Jen. Um, when we look at 
ignoring something. Uh, I'll give you an example. If I invited you all to stop thinking about a bear, so ignore it, ignore your thought and stop thinking about the bear. What is likely happening is that you are all thinking about the bear. <laughs> it is hard to stop thinking about the bear. Uh, it's hard to ignore that. And so um, I appreciate the question that uh, this person is asking around. It, it is hard. Uh, it makes sense that it's difficult to try and, and ignore it. Uh, we talked about how uh, anxiety works today and how when we're thinking about something, so I'll use the example of the foot pain, it takes center stage. There is a big spotlight on it and telling yourself to ignore it, ignore it, ignore it can lead to even greater intensity around that. You're paying even more attention to it. So we talked about one of the strategies uh, around mindfulness is perhaps instead of utilizing ignoring, and sometimes, by the way, I, I do want to say that sometimes we do need distraction from the pain. Maybe it's getting so bad that you, you truly do need to try to take your mind off of it, and so you might do something else around that. Uh, so that's different because that's kind of trying to ground you uh, in something else. Um, but when it comes to mindfulness, and maybe the pain is at a level where you can kind of bear with it and sit with it and uh, accept that this is happening and notice the sensations, that might be uh, another way to um, uh, experience the pain rather than trying to push it away and push it away and push it away. So that can lead to internal tension with us. So engaging in relaxation, calming and knowing, okay, I'm having this thought, my, my pain is coming up. All right, let me sit with it here. Okay, let me take that breath. And what is something that I can do with this pain? Should I engage in more relaxation breathing? Do I need to turn to um, another strategy, uh, medication? Or could I be practicing some helpful positive coping statements to help me through this? Oh. With mindfulness, there I notice it again, that pain sensation is coming up. Okay, here comes that pain sensation. All right, here it is with me now. I'm describing it for what it is. I'm noticing it or paying attention to it and then deciding what to do about it. I hope that uh, answers part of your question and I hope that that was helpful. I'm just wondering, Dr. G, because this person is saying that they're, they, they're feeling like they're actually doing more damage um, by, you know, by applying this, these techniques. Um, would you, well, I don't know, do you want to comment on that piece of the question? Sure. Um, sometimes when things feel more overwhelming or painful or we're thinking we're doing damage, that's a, a great point to start asking for help and seeking professional support and guidance and advice. And uh, a reminder that these strategies are not the be all and the end all. They are brief, almost like sh shorter versions of strategies that have more depth and more information. And sometimes we need or we could benefit from a professional, a health professional who is familiar and is an expert in these areas to guide you through some things. So if you feel that the strategies are making them worse, you could certainly stop um, and then ask uh, for professional health advice and get some more guidance around that. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a helpful note to end on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I'm not seeing any other questions and we're just a, about out of time. So I just wanna thank you again for taking the time today to teach us about um, the relationship between fear and anxiety and uh, you know the reality of I think what we're all dealing with now um, on top of pain. Um, so that was a really helpful presentation, I think, with a lot of practical tips. Uh, I want to say thanks to everybody who came today um, for taking the time and, and uh, learning with us. Um, we hope that you enjoyed that present today's presentation. 
and it was nice to see uh, all of your names in the chat and uh, speak with you in the chat and uh, in the Q&A. So wishing you all a terrific week and um, until we see you next time. Thanks again and stay safe.